Welcome to Weekly Catch Up Out and About with Truth. Uh, November's been absolutely awesome. I've been absolutely flat out. If we go back to the start of the month, I was actually away for the Victorian Indigenous Statewide Homelessness Network conference and we travelled up to Echuca. And it was awesome to be up there on the Murray and uh, we got to uh, hear some pretty good news. There's been some changes recently to, uh, well, the, the, the acts and policies and, uh, well, the, the laws basically, in regard to uh, for renters. So uh, there's been some, some good news there. And we also, it was great to meet, meet up with uh, you know, all the various people from different organisations that are spread right across Victoria. And it's, it really just shows that, uh, you know, the issue of homelessness and, and, you know, people doing it very, very tough has spread right across the state and indeed across the country. So, it, you know, we need to really start moving towards uh, trying to sort some things out because otherwise this thing will just get away from us. Anyway, the conference was great. We had, we had an awesome, it was an awesome trip up there. We had great weather. We went out on a, on a really cool uh, big boat ride up on the Murray and that was, that was entertaining. Uh, really can't really say too much about that. There was some horrible, there was some karaoke going on. I have a theory. Uh, most people that sing can't, and those very same people invented karaoke. So there you go. That's that's my theory. But it was a great trip, and I'm planning on wrapping that up. I've got a heap of footage, and we've got some cool stuff in there. So I hope to wrap that up, and I'm going to get that up before Christmas. So I'll, I'll, I'll get that out. Um. We've also got a state election coming up. In my last episode, I was talking about the fact that there was, there was an election coming. I've recently done some work with James Williams, who's a Greens candidate, is the, the Greens candidate for Essendon. And uh, it's been great to work on some videos that were a little bit different to what I normally put together. So, so that, was, that was fun and, and entertaining. Uh, most recently, though, I've done one of the, probably one of the coolest jobs I've, I've done so far in, in, in all the stuff I've worked on. And, I've been doing some work for uh, Bosch Australia, and uh, been doing going to put together some promotional stuff for basically internal use uh, about their employees that have been playing in the corporate games. And the corporate games is uh, well Melbourne, the corporate games Melbourne. It um, they have companies all across the place have 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 people who engage in a whole wide range of sports, and it was uh, pretty exciting to see different groups who wouldn't normally engage with each other, just just getting onto their particular sporting field and and just having a crack. And it was uh, it was it was very well run. I was quite impressed and uh, it was yeah it was really cool and like I say just great doing some work for a big you know multinational company is uh, is quite nice. Uh, I can't actually show you any of that because that's the way it goes when with some of this work. But um, it was exciting stuff, nevertheless, and um, still got a little bit to do. And then I've got to wrap up, wrap it all together and put together some packages. So, I mean, this is the type of work I want to do, so it's nice to be getting there. People who have watched my channel for quite a while may have, would remember that I've, I've featured a lot about the plight of public housing. Um, we've talked recently about the public housing renewal scheme. There's a lot of people who are, who are pushing against this sort of thing. You know, look, I'm not saying that the public housing... The, the thing is, they've got the public housing now saying it's all run down. They didn't spend a cent on maintenance. Might have spent a cent, but they didn't spend much on maintenance. If you own a car and you don't take it to the mechanic every now and then, of course the thing falls apart. That's exactly what's happening with the public housing. They want to spend money on it, it's now run down, and now they're just going to kick people out. And they're going to rebuild, and it's not going to be public housing. It'll be social housing, community housing, different models. I've spoken about this before. There's a difference between community housing, social housing, and public housing. But right now, with the lead up to the election, to wrap it all together, there's a group of people, Joe Tos Toscano and a few other people, people who have been involved with Defend and Extend Public Housing. But anyway, there's a heap of guys and girls down there at Parliament House. They're there for 10 days. And I rocked up only a few days ago on the Wednesday when they started and they're going to be there right through to almost the election so I thought there was a chance to see them as they started Stinking about stopping First one we had
Welcome to the Anarchist World this week. Broadcast live from the corner of and Spring Street in Melbourne. There's a tram you're hearing going around the corner. You can hear buses, you can hear trams. I'm sitting on the steps of the Victorian Parliament House. Broadcasting to you live, courtesy of the Community Radio Network, streaming live on 3cr.org.au. This program is podcast. You can access the podcast by going to 3cr.org.au. I'm looking at the Hotel Windsor, dreaming of high tea on Sunday afternoon. This is the beginning of a 10-day vigil on the steps of the Victorian Parliament House to make, not promote, but make, public housing a major election issue for the election on the 24th of November. Now, I'm afraid if you're listening to this program anywhere else in Australia, I will be concentrating on the 10-day vigil, but uh, let's we'll see how it goes. Now, if you know what Anarchy is all about, Anarchy Society is a voluntary, non-hierarchical society based on the creation of political and social structures, which are based on equal decision-making power that's direct democracy, a society where wealth is held in common, used for the community. Very conservative concepts. People before railway crossings. If you look at Victoria, you'll know what that's all about. Now why public housing? Why is this such a significant issue? Why isn't anybody interested? Now, when I woke up this morning, it was pouring rain, I thought, not only is the government against us, the state government, the federal government, the federal opposition, the state opposition, the church groups, the community and social housing groups, you know, the uh, the media, and I thought even the gods are against us, but uh, fortunately the rain has modified to a light drizzle, and I can assure you after speaking to the gods that by the afternoon it will be reasonable within 48 hours of the sun. So this is a serious attempt to make public housing an issue. Why public housing? Now look, I'm going to... Look, I shouldn't be doing this program today. I'll tell you why. Because this is simple reformist stuff. This isn't revolutionary. This isn't blood in the streets. This isn't even, you know, about anarchism. Unless you take anarchism to its logical, uh, logical definition. Without rulers, society without rulers, how do you create that? Like, you know, sharing wealth. So an anarchist is somebody, in my opinion, who does what they can to improve people's lives. Now, central to any human being's capacity to live a reasonable life is the, is the ability to have secure, safe housing. In Australia, over the last 40 years, housing has changed from something that you strove to achieve to a commodity. So we're going to be here, and you're going to be here, from the 14th. 24th yeah. November. But there's, there's a few dozen of us, everybody will laugh and say, look at these losers sitting in the rain, you know, uh, trying to, you know, uh, increase awareness about public health. If there's a hundred of us here, it'll start to be an issue. If there's a thousand of us here, on the steps of the Victorian Parliament House in the corner of Spring and Berg Street, it becomes an issue, it becomes their problem. Public house is then brought to the attention of the public as a significant public issue. Now people say, well, Joe, all you do is bloody to a woman. You've got no idea about costs. Sometimes. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and welcome. A special thanks for you all coming on a fairly inclement day, although we hope it's not going to pour raining. But it is Melbourne. I'm Ian Mitchell. I'm the uh, president of the East Melbourne Group, which is a group that's been around for 65 years and represents about 500 people. But today we're actually appearing for the wider inner community uh, because it affects not just East Melbourne, it affects all of the inner suburbs. So before I introduce our guest speaker, uh, I'd like to identify the impacts uh, the aircraft noise have had on the inner Melbourne communities. Uh, for many years, the need for legislative change uh, has been recognised by many communities across Australia and especially in inner Melbourne. 
there's an inadequate balance between the interests of the aviation industry and the rights of citizens to the peaceful enjoyment of their homes without the unrelenting impact of noise from overflights. We need to get politicians and decision makers to act to protect us and to ensure proper regulation of the airspace over our city. Regulations must take into account community concerns about amenity and livability as a result of increasing air traffic. So in summary, the impact of aircraft noise on the individual members of our community is not reasonable. If you can't sit quietly in your own garden, if you can't sleep at night, if you can't get children to bed, you can't have a conversation with your partner at dinner, if you can't provide genuine palliative care to a patient, if you can't have a community event, if air safety is still an issue, then the imbalance must be addressed now. I do have a, partic a, per not a, partic a petition uh, document here um, up, up behind me, and so I encourage you all to, to sign that and get the message across. So I have pleasure in introducing our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Adam Bant, uh, Federal Member for Melbourne. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, um, Ian, and I'm here with Ellen Sandal, the State Member for Melbourne, and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners. I want to acknowledge fellow councillor from the area, Jackie Watts, who I can see here, and on behalf of Rohan Leppert, our Greens councillor, who uh, he sends his apologies, and also Fiona Patton, uh, Upper House member, who's here as well. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay respects to elders past and present, and just give a quick shout out to the unaffiliated group that's next to us, who's here about to begin a 10-day sleep out in the lead up to the um, election. We've got 82,000 people in Victoria on waiting lists for public housing, uh, and in fact, under the government, uh, the last time we saw the figures, if you're homeless, the waits actually got longer rather than getting shorter. And it, uh, there's something wrong when in a wealthy country like Australia, we've still got so many people who are homeless and so many people who can't afford to live here. So um, a shout out to all of you and we hope that we can get some action on that as well. I really want to thank Ian Shelley and the whole <coughs> East Melbourne group for continuing um, to push this and continuing this fight. And one of the things that has gone completely unregulated, and it seems no one has put any thought into, is what happens with uh, choppers, with small fixed wing aircraft, and also with large fixed, uh, large fixed wing aircraft over our city. And one of the most stunning images I have seen that really brought home to me everything that Ian has just been explaining about what many of you are living through is a time-lapse map of the flight paths over East Melbourne taken over a 24-hour period. And when you look at that, it's like someone's got put their fork in a whole plate of spaghetti and twisted it around in a big loop, because what you see is flights coming in and people doing loop the loop around the MCG and around some of Melbourne's tourist attractions and doing it on repeat and then leaving. And that's not even on a day when there's a football final on, when you might have them hovering over there for a very long period of time. And the more that we looked into it, as this was brought to our attention, the more that we looked into it, the most astonishing thing to discover is that so much of this is unregulated. It's Rafferty's rules. And it's allowed um, industry to just basically do whatever it wants without any thought to safety and without any thought um, to amenity. And so when we say, for example, um, aren't there other alternatives other than to having your chopper hang, hanging out over people's lounge rooms and backyards, I say, well, it's our right to do it, and there's no regulation stopping us from doing it. When you look at other cities, they've managed with a bit of planning to get this right. And um, there's some simple fixes too, if we have the political will here in Melbourne. One simple thing that we could do now, at least with the small aircraft, is go back to the way it was about 10 or 15 years ago, where we say to them, if you want to come in and out to have a look at the tourist sites, follow the route of the river. You don't have the right to hover over people's houses or to do continual loop the loops. You'll still be able to see everything that you want, but just follow the route of the river and stay away from people's houses. Um, 
What we also have found is that in recent times they have changed the flight path of the large aircraft that come in and out. So that one of the, uh, Ian knows the terminology better than me, but basically one of the turning points is just out east over there. So that a lot of the, the uh, flights that are coming in, they all effectively come to that point and then do a, a right hand turn or a left hand turn as the case may be and then basically come in in a loop over here before they head down to the airport. There was no consultation with residents before they made that decision. They just went ahead and made that decision and it turns out that under the law they can do that as well. And so we're pushing for two things. Um, one is to change the flight path and the flight instructions that are given to them. Um, that are given to the uh, uh, to the small aircraft. It's called the visual visual flight visual flight guidelines, something something like that. In a way that they've done in Sydney, in a way that they've done in Sydney, so that as those small aircraft come in, they're required to steer away from residential areas. Now that is not a hard ask. It's not a big ask. Um, we're pushing to get the council on board with that uh, to get our new mayor to help with that push, uh, and we're sitting down with. The, uh, with the federal government to try and get their support for that push as well. Because in the short term, that could at least be a partial fix for the small aircraft. Um, but we also need, I think, some more structural solutions. And so we're progressing a bill through Parliament that would have the effect of doing two things. One is giving residents greater rights, including residents in here, not just people who live near airports, but people who are affected by the noise and the flight paths generally, to sit down before these decisions are made um, to say, no, this is the impact that's going to have on us. So that would deal with the big aircraft and we want it to be retrospective. So they have to go back and talk about the new flight paths that aren't so new now, but the ones that are in place. But we're also pushing for a no-fly zone over inner city Melbourne. And um, we're saying that up to 2,000 metres within five k's of the CBD, you just shouldn't be able to fly. Now, there should of course be exceptions for that because we all know and no one would suggest that choppers that are flying into and out of hospital or police or emergency services aircraft um, shouldn't be able to do it. Everyone understands that that should, um, that should remain, but they're not the problem. They're not the problem. It's the tourists and it's the traffic stuff that's the problem. Um, and people might say, well, that's a fairly radical solution. Well, it's what Paris does. It's what Paris does, because they've made the decision that their city and the amenity of their city and the safety of their city is something that's worth protecting. And actually, Melbourne is a city that's best experienced from the ground. Um, Melbourne's a, a city that's best experienced walking around or getting on tram. And they've said the same in Paris. And they've said, we are not going to have our amenity and our beauty disrupted by continual flights over us. And so you just can't fly your tourist aircraft over Paris. And I think we should do the same here in Melbourne as well, with appropriate exemptions. But we should do the same here in Melbourne. So it's something that we're going to keep pushing for. Um, and our task now is to try and get the other parties on board with this. And a big part of that is um, we've got to break the perception that this is just a minor issue. This is just a minor issue and the odd flight every now and then. Well, it's not. It's the signs of growing pains in a city where you haven't planned properly. And it's potentially going to get worse now with Uber saying that they want to bring in Uber Air. Um, and have choppers being able to ferry people all the way around the city as well. Melbourne residents could be among the first people in the world to take a ride in the sky aboard Uber's new aerial drone taxis. Our city has been named among five global finalists for the first test flights, which are scheduled for 2020. It's an idea still up in the air. An eVTOL, an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. But if technology giant Uber succeeds, Melbourne could be among the first cities in the world to trial drone taxis, announced as one of five shortlisted for test flights in 2020. We'll be having uh, deeper discussions with, with uh, different cities, and Melbourne's one of them. Showcasing the latest prototype at an expo in Tokyo, Uber confirmed it's finalising an electric demonstrator drone, which it hopes will be able to transport four passengers up to 100 kilometres for the same price as an UberX. You will literally open up the Uber app 
just like you do to get a ground ride, and you'll have, see a new choice, and that will be Uber Air. If you work in the CBD, you could live in one of the cheaper suburbs and still get to work in just 15 minutes. But there's still work to do, with technicians fine-tuning the batteries to charge more quickly. They're also developing military-grade software to safeguard against hackers and crashes. While the initial test flights will most likely use existing helipads, Uber's vision involves building skyports all over the city, creating a new mass transit system in the sky. Lots of safety issues to look at, but all of them can be worked through. To those who remain a little bit sceptical. The guys on Star Trek pulled out a communicator and they talked on it, and everyone was like, that'll never happen. The trial city will be revealed by the end of the year. Can't be afraid to dream. Christy Mayer, 7 News. So we need to regulate this. Um, it's not just you speaking out, it is a broader problem. This is not a um, not in my backyard problem, it's a problem about how we plan our cities. We're working side by side with you in the federal parliament, the state parliament and the local council. And um, once we break through that barrier and get people to understand exactly the scale of this problem, I feel hopeful that someday we're going to see some action on it. So I'm sorry that you have to put up with it and keep having to put up with this for longer, um, but I hope we're going to get it changed soon. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Hi, I'm Ellen Sandal. I'm the State Greens representative for Melbourne, which covers East Melbourne, and Ian just asked me to say a couple of words in addition to Adam. I got a personal taste of this issue just a couple of weeks ago. I live in Kensington, quite near the Flemington Racecourse, and the volume of chopper traffic uh, over our house and our backyard and our parks was quite phenomenal. But we only get that for a week or a couple of weeks a year. We get it every day, every week, all year. I've been working very closely with the East Melbourne group on this important issue, including raising it with the Premier, raising it in this parliament right here several times. The Greens are working on this issue at every level of government, state level, federal level, also the local level. I know Greens councillor Cathy Oak um, tried to get air companies to sign fly neighbourly agreements to agree to do the right thing by residents. Voluntary agreements, as we know, have not worked. And that's just one example of why we need regulation on this. It can't just be up to each individual company to do the right thing, because we've tried that and it hasn't worked. As Adam said, this isn't just an issue that's isolated to a small group of people. This goes to that broader issue of how we want our city to be, how we want to live our lives, and whether governments give control of our city to big corporates and industry, or whether the community actually takes priority. We've seen this Labor government, government unfortunately, sell off so many of our public assets. We've sold off the port. They want to sell off public housing land. They're giving companies like Transurban carte blanche to do what they like with our transport cities. And now this. We're seeing the corporatisation of our politics rather than uh, politics being for the people and for the community, which is what it should be about. And so that's uh, part of the reason I'm so passionate about this issue is saying that we can't let big corporates and industry take over, take over our politics because this city is for people. That's what being in a community in a city is about. So I look forward to continuing to work with you on this issue in state parliament and um, if I'm still here uh, after ten, in 10 days time after the election I very much look forward to tabling your petition right here in state parliament. Thank you, Adam, and thank and, and uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, we've got another two speakers to come. Uh, first up, Fiona Patton. Uh, I'll ask her to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and, and thank you all for coming here to raise this issue. Um, I, I I first actually heard Shelley just to, well. I think hearing Shelley on the radio with John Fain the other day. Um, raising this issue and John Fain was disbelieving. How could that possibly be the, the issue? How could it possibly be that private companies don't have any regulation about where they fly, 
in the, particularly in East Melbourne and particularly around the MCG. Disbelief, absolute disbelief. And it's true and it's extraordinary and it has to change. And I certainly, as someone who has um, only been in the parliament for the last four years, but what, what has troubled me um, over that time is the absolute lack of planning. There is no future plan. It seems we plan to the next election and we will flip-flop on infrastructure, we will flip-flop on legislation. There is no great planning that crosses all of our departments. There's some silo planning, but I want to see planning that covers our transport, covers our infrastructure, covers our health, covers our ageing policy, covers our justice policy brought together. And as Adam mentioned, this is only going to get worse. Technology is changing. You know, Amazon wants to deliver your packages by drone. Um, we're seeing Uber uh, has, just, has just launched Uber Elevate, which again is about delivering passengers by, by drone. So we desperately need to get some regulation in this that, that, that future-proofs your amenity, for the, not for just for the next two years, but for the next 20 years, for the next 30 years. Thank you, Fiona. I'd now like to call on Dr Jackie Watts, the Melbourne City Councillor, who chairs the Knowledge City Portfolio. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, everybody, being here once again. The residents have to show the way, don't they? I'm elected to Melbourne City Council as a community activist originally, first and foremost seven years ago, and the, an inkling of the problem developing has been going on for the entire time. Council has been cognizant of the problem and has been completely impotent, as far as I can see, to do anything about it. It's quite correct. We keep striking brick walls. What we can do now is continue, I suspect, to advocate and start throwing your weight around, I urge you, during this time of political um, hyperactivity. The technology driving its way into uh, degrading our lives, isn't it? In this instance, we're talking about aircraft. It's going to be drones, it's going to be trouble, and we're always on the back foot. I encourage you greatly, and I understand that although you're hearing from politicians today, it goes beyond party politics. This is about your rights, human rights to peace, and amenity and all of those things that have been described so far. More power to your arm, call on council to help you whenever we can and we will respond. I'm fairly confident that we will keep, keep up a very strong advocacy role. If there, is there anything we can do to really publicise your plight, um, pl please let me know. I'm Deputy Chair of People City and what it is is in fact affecting the way you actually feel. It's affecting the way your lives are unfolding, your lives and mine. So I, I wish you well, and I cross my fingers for us all. Thank you, Thank you Jackie, much appreciated. Now we're going to have some local speakers, and uh, the first one is Peter Hanlon, a resident of East Melbourne. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ian, and um, appreciate the opportunity today. Um, I'm a fairly recent arrival in East Melbourne, only been there 13 years, so uh, still a lot to learn. Um, I'm also uh, in interested in this because I'm standing as an independent uh, MP for Melbourne in the upcoming election, so um, this is an area where um, I would look to be uh, pursuing the cause on behalf of all East Melbourne residents, and all Melbourne, because it's a Melbourne-wide um, uh, issue for everybody. Um, in terms of uh, how, um, w what I'm trying to take forward, um, uh, I buy into a lot of what has been said before me. Um, uh, this, uh, this state needs to wake up. Uh, it won't be lucky forever. It's got to get better education, better curriculum courses out there, get the regions with tech hubs, and be bold and look to the future, um, uh, rather, and reform a lot of the medical and dental practices out there so that half the population hasn't got its teeth rotting away. So I, I'm, I'm for a, a, a bold, disruptive approach. In terms of this particular issue, um, uh, I, I buy into what everybody says. Um, 
it, it really is an example of awful government, and we've seen a lot of that in the last <laughs> 10 years. You know, no advice to uh, st stakeholders, no consultation with stakeholders, no risk analysis evidence of it, no environmental uh, business case out there to take it forward, conflicted interests all the way through, no um, risk mitigation, and basically no post audit. So it, it's awful governance and, and government and it needs to be overturned uh, on, on all those uh, seven or eight precepts. And I think it will be overturned, because when you look at the Herald Sun today, and they're spending a fortune on bollards in the city, but you think they've actually got no control of the sky. It's absolutely fantastic, you know? <laughs> Are they all going to come driving vans, or might somebody hijack a, a jet from Essendon and fly in and fly over? I mean, it's total uh, political and, and kind of establishment myopia. Um, so I'm, I'm convinced this will work because the original basis is all wrong. Um, we've got a great uh, uh, momentum going on it for um, everybody across Melbourne. And um, I'm happy to put my children to help and support uh, and look to make it happen uh, for everybody in Melbourne. So thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to call on Greg Bissonella. Greg is uh, on the East Melbourne Group Committee with me. He's uh, our planning convener. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Ian, and thanks everybody else for coming out today to support our cause. We want to put a call out today to the Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison. His mantra recently has been, I am listening and I am hearing. We've heard him say it many times, I am listening and I am hearing. So Prime Minister, if you are listening, we want to tell you that the residents of Melbourne were not consulted when commercial aircraft flights were changed to be over our homes. We did not vote for a Qantas A380 plane to drown out our dinner conversations. And we certainly did not vote for commercial aircraft to fly over our homes every three to five minutes, day and night. There is a simple solution. We repeat, there is a simple solution. Support the Air Services Amendment Bill and consult with the people of Melbourne before changes to flight paths are made move commercial flights away from residential areas. They were previously diverted over the bay, as we heard, and they could easily go back and do that again. Ban non-emergency light aircraft and helicopters from flying over our homes. Thank you, Greg. Call on Susan Henderson, uh, also a member of the East Melbourne Group Committee and a long-time resident. Thank you, Ian. Um, my name's Susan, as Ian just mentioned, and uh, I've been a resident of East Melbourne for 25 years. I'm deeply concerned that the tenfold increase in the aircraft, a a aircraft activity over inner Melbourne since 2011 is impacting on our sense of safety, security and peaceful lifestyle. We understand that in 2011 there was a relaxing of the guidelines and policing of controlled airspace over our city. This is quite contrary to what's happening, as you've already heard, in other cities around the world. And we have unfortunately seen some recent disasters. Unless our legislators and regulators act to protect our rights, we'll continue to be exposed to increasing volumes of air traffic and the associated noise and risks. It's definitely impacting our everyday life and we really would like to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I just call on Donna McCage. Uh, Donna's a, a highly militant. Uh, uh, <laughs> just joking. She's, she's also a long-term resident of East Melbourne. Thank you. Um, aircraft noise uh, over East Melbourne is loud and unrelenting. It includes commercial jets, small aircraft, and helicopters at all hours, and that's all hours of the day and night. This has created a noise gutter over our beautiful city. It's often hard to have a conversation. The doors, windows and furniture rattle. And uh, it's impossible to sleep at night with the windows open. It has become unbearable and exhausting living in our homes and gardens. Honourable members, you have a responsibility for the health and safety of your constituents, us, your constituents. Please ensure proper, responsible regulation of airspace over our beautiful city. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. I'm going to call on John uh, Lawson from South Yarra. 
uh, to give a, a different perspective. Thank you. Actually, on my blow in to East Melbourne, we own the Army Drill Hall on the corner of Powlett Street. We've owned that since the 90s. I've got a foot in both camp. I also live opposite Faulkner Park. The interesting thing is to compare the situation in South Yarra with the helicopters, and they're very necessary, going to the Alfred Hospital, they cause no trouble. They stick to one path and the residents never complain because A, they're not particularly noisy, they get up in the air as quick as they can and disappear. A few years ago, we had a number of helicopters that would land on Faulkner Park. We complained and they disappeared. Now, we don't want the helicopters coming from Melbourne <laughs> or East Melbourne to South Yarra, but I just thought I'd speak out and say that there is a contrast and I totally support your cause. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I think uh, I was speaking with one of the residents uh, of Richmond uh, earlier today and she said, uh, you know, are we talking about potentially moving the problem to another suburb? And, and the short answer is no, we're not. Uh, what we're trying to do here is to get um, legislative change uh, that applies across all of inner Melbourne and has the voices of the people heard wherever they are, East Melbourne, Richmond, Kensington, whatever it is. Um, and, and, and that's the main thing we're trying to get. Um, and as we just heard, you can certainly do a lot by changing the flight paths uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to look after residents. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Shelley. Uh, uh, Shelley is the main organiser. She'll finish us up today. And uh, she's been doing a magnificent job uh, in, in coordinating all of our, our activities with the politicians um, and with residents. So, Shelley Forbel. Thank you. Uh, you've heard everything before, but I'll just want to say from my perspective too, thank you all for coming today. We are here today because there is no government body to look after the human environment when it comes to aviation. We endure relentless joy and training flights over our homes. They do not have to submit a flight path or engage with air traffic control when they're over our areas. They're old fixed wing aircraft and they have been given exemption from noise control. And these were built after, during or before and after the Second World War. We are also very much concerned about the safety, security and accident and also terrorism. As Peter has said, there have been many things done to protect on land, like near MCG, you cannot park for a certain area. We have bollards, we have cameras, but one can get a small aircraft or a helicopter and you fly visually. There is no flight path. In cities like Paris, as has been mentioned before, Vienna, Singapore, joy and training flights are not permitted. Air services is a closed entity. Even aircraft noise ombudsman is funded by them and reports to their board. How strange is that? Instead of engaging with our communities, we were asked no longer to contact, contact them with our concerns. They will not reply to us. And at the moment, there is a request, a letter that we have sent to the CEO of Air Services, a registered letter, and we haven't heard from them, and it's over two months now. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost my note. Um, and we feel that there needs to be an inquiry into Air Services Australia. Being a closed entity, they don't have to answer to anyone. 
Without consultation, we now have, as you have heard, large passenger aircraft flying over in a concentrated way, four to five minutes before they land at Calabarine Airport. We, the affected community, want to be consulted and we want the skies over, our, uh, over us to be regulated. We want to be able to live in peace, in health, and we want Melbourne to be the most livable city again. I thank you all for coming today. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. And if you think that these, these helicopters are only taken off from Essendon and Tullamarine Airport, they don't actually not many go from Tullamarine, but they certainly go from Essendon. Behind me is the main helipad on the Yarra, opposite Grand Casino. Batteries. Over the next 10 days, you will be coming here. From 10 there'll be 20, from 20 there'll be 100, from 100 there'll be 1,000. If you want public housing to exist after this state election, you need to be here. We will hold that banner up 24 hours a day for the next 10 days. We have the solution to every problem in Victoria, except the weather. We have the solution. Stamp duty, $6 billion raised last year. Quarantine it, public housing, house one million Victorians by 2029. Eradicate homelessness in one month. Remove the waiting list in a year. Put tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars into the economy. When rent, rents drop at the lower end of the market and the housing market, entry level costs decrease. Improve public security. Up yours, Matthew Guy. <laughs> Improve public security. And you do it by having a strong, stable, secure public housing sector. Both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party will privatise it if they win the next election, this election on the 24th of November, in their own right. Victorian Greens have a strong public housing policy, not as strong as ours, and the Victorian Socialists have a strong public housing policy, not as strong as ours. 
we will put our bodies on the line. We will sleep here for the next 10 days. We will raise this issue. We will make this issue. Because this is central, central to what we are as a people and a nation. This is fully costed. You don't need to build anything. You can spot purchase around the state. Six billion dollars will buy you 30,000 units and homes around this state every year. Why aren't people supporting such a simple concept? Why isn't public housing an issue at this state election? I'm standing in the seat of Albert Park as an independent candidate promoting this. And Martin Foley, what do you think the housing minister has done? He's put me sixth on his preference list out of seven candidates. He hates public housing. And he hates you, public housing activists. And it's the same with Matthew Guy. Has he said a, a word about public housing? Yeah, we're going to privatise it. The alternative Liberal Party masquerading as the Labor Party. And, whoops, there goes an ambulance. Oh. Ah, oh, well. Life in a big city. Okay, so public housing, everybody's business. Come and join us. Hashtag public housing parliamentary vigil. Let everybody know. Hashtag. But more important than your bloody hashtag, come here. Bring your asses here. If there's 20 of us, nobody cares. If there's 100 of us, they'll start worrying. If there's 1,000 of us and we block Spring Street, public housing will be the major election issue for this election on the 24th of November. Come and join us. Come and join us now. We'll be here. We're just waiting for you. Bring food and drinks. Entertain us. Have a chat to the wee hours of the morning, watch the sunrise with us. If we can see it through the smog. Yeah. And watch the parliamentary house. Millions, tens of millions of dollars of renovations. What for? When 50 metres down the bloody street there are people sleeping rough. It's ridiculous. Now there's an open forum here for the next 10 days. If you feel like it, talk. Help the people who are holding the banners, because if those, that banner goes, we go. Thank you. Everybody, you got you got ten days. I'm recording as of now, so don't stress out, I can edit anything out. Get 
especially from midnight to 6 a.m. Bums right. on seats. Bums on seats. Excuse me. Hand on the pole. Hand. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome to Spring Street. Yeah, yeah. Well, well it's, a, it, it's a fifth, you know, you need to hold the pole up. It's, a, it's like an endurance yeah. test. Ten days, we're nearly, tomorrow we'll be this, halfway this, there. Banner has not been down for one second. No. If it goes down, we stop and go home. So we may have to do that in the next few days if we don't get you here. Yeah. All right, it's Sunday the 18th of November. The big days will be that where we're going to really struggle. It'll be Monday the 19th, Tuesday the 20th, Wednesday the 21st. After that, the wannabes will turn up and do the last night. But we want the hard Cool. We want people here who can sleep overnight, who can hold the banner, who are funny, who are activists, who are strong. That's what we want. That's what we need. That's what we need. Yeah. We need, we need. Because we're in it together. And we're and, here, and we're here for other what would you, people. What would you say to any prospective politicians that are vying for office with up the upcoming election? What, what, do you, what message do you want to send to them? People before infrastructure. It's very simple. We have tens of thousands of people on the, in this state who get food hands out every day. We have tens of thousands of people who are in, who are in unstable accommodation, including children, right? Women, pregnant women, children, old people, sleeping rough, uh, sleeping in cars, couch surfing, staying with relatives, staying in unsuitable relationships. People with health issues as well? Yeah, health issues. Now, this government, this state government, collected $6 billion in stamp duty revenue last year. Stamp duty is the tax which is paid when you buy a home. It's, simple, it's a government tax on your home. You don't get those papers unless you pay that stamp duty up front, okay? Six billion. If you quarantine that six billion dollars for public housing, you can eradicate homelessness in one month, you can eradicate the waiting list in one year, and you can house one million Victorians who will never be able to buy their own home in secure, stable public housing for 25% of their income by 2029. And you don't need to build huge apartments. All you need to do is spot purchase from the private marketplace properties and units around the state. That's what we need to do. And it needs to be done now. They're out there campaigning about law and order. Why is there a law and order problem? Because there's no housing. Simple. Why is there a you know, law and order about you? The police will tell you, and I've had many discussions with the police, you cannot police your way out of this situation. It doesn't matter how many laws you have, how many police, how many powers they have, 
the problem will grow unless the issue of stable, secure, affordable housing is addressed. They're out there campaigning, telling you it's all about railway crossings and roads and so-called law and order problems, but the central issue is housing affordability. That is the central issue. And if you grow the public housing sector, you get a strong public housing sector, it competes with the private marketplace, helps to reduce rents, reduces prices at entry level for young people, increases social cohesion, decreases crime, and has improved health outcomes. Having people who are homeless, having people who are couch surfing, having people in insecure accommodation, creates a cross for this society's back for generations to come. So, I can talk to the cows come home. We can all talk to the cows come home. But this is not going to change unless there is a, a legislative solution. The 88 new members of the Legislative Assembly and the 40 members of the Legislative Council need to make this their number one priority when Parliament is resumed after the next election. We don't care. We don't care. We don't care who's there. What we care about is the fact that they will take some action on this. Oh yeah. You got sunscreen up there, have